Ionia is the name of a collection of islands located to the northeast of Runeterra. The people of this land seek to find balance, both within themselves and the world around them. There is no industrialization or centralized government in Ionia, simply a collection of scattered people living as one with the land around them. This pursuit of balance has allowed the natural world and the spirits who live there to thrive. And because of this, the land itself radiates with raw magic, allowing spirits that have yet to cross over into the material plane to do so with relative ease, at least compared to other places on Rune Terra. There are a huge variety of spirits that call this land their home, especially in the more remote areas of Ionia, with the strongest and most dangerous spirits residing in the deepest forests and the tallest mountains. Modern day Ionia is very different to the land that it once was, with the recent invasion of Noxus changing much, but we'll get onto that a bit later on. The Ionians have long embraced the spirits of the land and seek to live alongside them in harmony and balance, often to the benefit of both spirit and mortal alike. This is most obvious in their architecture, with many Ionian buildings constructed gracefully into the environment, creating as little impact as possible. Many of the buildings in Ionia are constructed through wood weaving, a practice by which wood weavers communicate with spirits that reside within trees, convincing them to grow into whatever shape is needed for the structure that's being built. This reduces the need to cut down trees, which Ionians avoid as much as possible, and the tree spirits often continue to grow, causing residents of a woodwoven home to often find themselves experiencing unplanned changes over time. It's not just woodweavers who can speak to the land, most Ionians have a degree of influence, and whilst many use these abilities to simply weave spells into their crops or into their fishing halls, this subtle control can be used offensively, which we'll see later on in the events of the Dreaming Pool story. Scattered across the entirety of Ionia are schools, temples and monasteries that train students in ancient martial arts, magic and philosophy amongst other things. Whilst most Ionians live by the lessons taught in these schools, very few are considered to be truly enlightened beings and can succumb to the same emotions as anyone else on the planet, whether those emotions be destructive, like hate, lust and anger, or positive emotions such as love, serenity and compassion. The teachings in these monasteries are often provided by members of a particular order or group of which we know of several. The Harana Order teach personal harmony and specialize in self-defense. The Kinkau Order, who are dedicated to the preservation of balance between the physical world and the spiritual realm. The Shojin Order, who teach inner healing and meditation. And the Wuju Order, who teach spiritual awareness. Many of the traditions passed down in these orders were shaken with the invasion of Noxus. And many now question the validity of their teachings in light of the new atrocities that they've experienced at the hands of the invading Noxian war hosts. Zed, for example, left the peace-seeking King Cow Order to create the Order of Shadows, a group of assassins who wield forbidden shadow magic against any and all outsiders. Another organisation worth mentioning here is the Navori Brotherhood, an extremist group of Ionian patriots who aim to unite the continent under a single rule and have gone as far as to attack other Ionians and Vastaya who don't agree with them. Speaking of the Vastaya, some 8,000 years ago, Ionia was invaded from the skies. This race of titans destroyed much of the continent and left such an impact that there's still evidence of this conflict today, at least in some of the more remote areas of Ionia. During this war, many of the most enlightened mortals drew the power of the spirit realm into themselves transforming them into the Vestaya Shirai, shape changers who were able to wield the natural world as weapons against the Titans. Using this new power, the Vestaya Shirai defeated the Titans, and despite being near immortal and immensely powerful, they settled alongside the humans as equals. Their descendants later became known as the Vestaya, and in time they formed their own tribes away from the humans. Today, centuries later, Vestaians are incredibly diverse, with Simeon, Avian and even Pisine variants, with talents and skills that differ wildly between each Vestaian. They also have a range of appearances from the more beast-like Rengar to those who appear a bit more human, such as Ari. 
they are found all over the world, but are certainly more common in their birthplace of Ionia. Now, due to their origins as deeply spiritual creatures, they are greatly attuned and sensitive to the magic of Rune Terra, and with the recent invasion of Noxus and the formation of new groups in Ionia who are thought to be abusing the world's magic, such as the Shadow Order, the Vestayan tribes in Ionia have begun to grow distrustful of humans as they do not seem to be respecting the natural world as they once did. It is worth mentioning here as well that some humans with very small amounts of Vestayan heritage are able to shapeshift into animals for a very short amount of time. These shapeshifters are remarkably rare, but can be found across all of Rune Terra. The Vestaya as a whole are quite interesting, and they probably warrant their own video focused on the race, their different types, and what magic they can use, so we'll leave that for another time. A lot happens during the occupation of Ionia by Noxus, and it's not super clear what order these things happen in, so I'll try to cover the events in an order that I feel makes the most sense. When Noxus first attacked Ionia, one of the first locations to be taken was the fortress of Faelor, a stronghold on the westernmost island of Ionia. Many decades prior, it had been used as a school to teach young students how to control their magic, but now served as a staging ground for Noxus to launch further assaults into the mainland of Ionia. It did not take long for rumours of foreign invaders from the west to reach across the rest of the continent, and a young girl named Aurelia, who was studying at the Placidium of Navori, heard these rumours and decided to return to her village. When she arrived, she discovered that her village was already occupied by the Noxians and that her family had been massacred for refusing to give up their family home, a home which was now the residence of several high-ranking Noxian officers led by Admiral Dacau. Driven by grief, Aurelia tapped into an unknown power that lay deep within herself and with a sweep of her arm, sent pieces of her shattered family crest hurtling through the air cutting clean through two of the Noxians that had surrounded her. She then fled into the nearby forest to grieve for the loss of her family. Similar occupations were occurring all over the continent, with many thousands of Ionians dying at the hands of the barbaric Noxian invasion. Despite this, many in Ionia refused to take up arms against Noxus, believing that doing so would upset the spiritual harmony and balance of the continent. But as Noxus continued to destroy the land and its people, many found themselves unable to sit by and began to fight back. Chief amongst these was Dara, the latest reincarnation of an ancient soul known as Karma, who for a thousand generations had taught peace and pacifism to the Ionian people. Dara willingly betrayed her previous incarnations and their teachings when she confronted a Noxian commander on the deck of his own warboat. Dara unleashed her fury obliterating the entire vessel and its crew in just mere seconds. And whilst many in Ionia rejoiced at this victory, Karma's most devout followers denounced and chastised her for her actions. Karma, however, believed that her retaliation was not only justified, but necessary to protect the land and its people. A flame of hope had been ignited in the Ionian people, and a resistance slowly began to grow. At some point during the war, Noxus launched an attack on Bard Mountain, a location somewhere on Ionia where a particularly powerful artifact was being held. The Ionians there ended up using the artifact in self-defence, and Bard, a celestial, took notice. He swooped in and essentially confiscated the artifact, presumably hiding it somewhere else in the cosmos, away from Rune Terror. Also around this time, there is an attack on the Ionian town of Palas. Kai and Valmar, two young beast hunters, attempt to defend the town, and whilst they're successful, one of the two takes a mortal blow and begins to slip away. Valmar refuses to let his lover die, and attempts to use the magic at the centre of the temple in Palas to save him. In doing so, Valmar and Kai unwillingly fuse their bodies and their souls with an ancient Darkin, who is later revealed to be Varus. Kai and Valmar wrestle the Darkin for control, and in the process kill several Noxian invaders. The three of them now journey across Rune Terra in a single body. But that's a story for another video. As resistances began to form across Ionia, a young King Cow monk. Uh, hi guys, sorry, it's actually pronounced the King Ku and not the King Cow. I make that mistake for the rest of the video. Uh, sorry about that.
a young Kinkau monk named Usan was struggling with the peaceful and pacifist teachings of the Kinkau. Some years earlier, he had helped to capture Kada Jin, a psychotic mass murderer, and after witnessing the brutality of Noxus, he began to grow disillusioned and bitter with the world, desiring justice for his people. He ventured deep into the Kinkau temple and discovered a hidden ornate black box, which, when opened, enveloped his mind, feeding into his bitterness and showing him the forbidden powers of shadow magic. Usal returned to the surface and demanded that the King Cow strike out at the Noxian invaders, using every power available to them, including the shadow magic. Master Kusho, the head of the order, refused this demand, and Asal turned his back on the order that had once given him purpose so he could defend the people of Ionia. Eventually, Asal would become known as Zed. Zed would eventually return to the temple in order to take the power that he and his men needed to defend his country, and in doing so took the Kinkau temple for his own, supposedly killing Master Kusho in the process. Many of the Kinkau joined Zed, and those loyal to the teachings of the Kinkau order would live on in the mountains, with Master Kusho's son, Shen, taking up the mantle of leader, alongside Kenan and Mame, who is Akali's mother. Now there is more story here, but for that I will direct you to the Zed comic book series. It's pretty good. Unbeknownst to Noctus, Faelor was more than just a fortress. It was a prison for the dark mage Syndra, who had in secret been sleeping beneath the fortress for several decades. A group of Ionians launched a desperate attack on Faelor to assassinate the sleeping Syndra, as they felt the Noxians would unleash her on the world should they discover her. Unknown to the Ionians, however, the current governor of Faelor was a Vestayan named Callan, who was working from within Noxus to prevent Syndra's discovery. The assassination almost succeeded, but the Ionians fell to infighting before they could assassinate the Dark Mage. Some argued that they should instead set her free and use her power to fight against the Noxians. During the chaos, Syndra awoke and raised several parts of the fortress into the sky and flew north, although not before killing most of the people in the fortress and proclaiming that all Ionians were considered to be her enemy. We do not know at this time where she went, but we do know that Cyric, the Ionian that attempted to assassinate Syndra, is still alive. A Noxian general named Emistan hired a Zornai alchemist to create chemtech bombs that could be used against the growing Ionian resistance. These bombs are used across much of Ionia, including against the village of Wuju, with Master Yi as the only survivor. Yi would later begin to train a Vistayan simian named Kong in the ways of Wuju. Eventually Kong would finish his training and adopt the name Wukong to demonstrate his mastery of Wuju. Master Yi and Wukong now travel across Ionia to combat injustice wherever they find it. And as a quick note, Riven and Quill both abandon Noxus after these war crimes and is a sign that Noxus, as inclusive as it is, might be going just a bit too far for many to stay loyal to the expansionist nation. Time will certainly tell on that one. Irelia was one of many to join the growing resistance, and eventually found herself hostage at the Placidium of Navori. Her band of resistance fighters had failed to defend the holy site from a Noxian general known as Jericho Swain, who had been helped by several Vestaya in exchange for the safety of their forests. Callan, the governor of Faelor, was just one of those Vestaya. She was later freed from her bonds when another set of resistance fighters tried to retake the Placidium from Swain. During this conflict, Aurelia once again leveraged her skills in dance for war and carved her way through the Noxian force, eventually striking down the general himself and hefting his severed arm high for all to see. General Swain miraculously survives the encounter, but is discharged from the Noxian military and stripped of his rank. News of this victory spreads across Ionia and marks a turning point in the war for the Ionian forces. Many now looked to Aurelia for leadership, and despite being reluctant to do so, she led the resistance until the end of the war. The reasons for the war's end are spoken about in my Noxus video, so go and check that out. The attack of Noxus was brutal and scarred much of the continent. It left thousands dead and both the people and the spirits of the land in disarray, 
and whilst Ionia does indeed still stand, it is divided, with the people of its orders unable to agree on a way forward. Some, such as the Brotherhood of Navori, feel that the continent should unite under a single banner, militarising the natural magic of the land and using it to destroy their enemies. Primarily Noxus, but also the Vestaians who had helped them during the war. The Kinkau continued to preach peace and pacifism, but with Shen of the Kinkau Order finally giving in to his hatred for Zed, this may soon change. Several Vestaians are now acting on their distrust of the humans, with Rakan and Zaya's dreams of a Vestaian rebellion against the humans looking more and more likely every day, and like the Kinkau, the Shojin Order wishes for peace and pacifism, but in a land unsettled by war, Syndra at large, a Navori Brotherhood that's moving ever closer to triggering a civil war, aggravated spirits, and even a possible Vestaian uprising, the fate of Aeonia is uncertain. What is certain, however, is that Noxus has once again invaded Ionia, as seen in the Awakened cinematic. Sion, an undead warlord, has been raised from his prison by Swain and leads the assault. By the looks of it, Aurelia once again leads the resistance, but this time she's aided by Akali, Karma, Yasuo, and strangely, Kenan, a member of the Kinkau. Yasuo's presence is interesting as well, because the ruined kin game shows us that he's particularly close to Ari, so the Vestaya may possibly leave their tribes to help defend the continent. That is, if they don't decide that all humans are their enemies anytime soon. Time will tell. Ionia has so many diverse and interesting characters that the storyline there can go so many different ways, it's really hard to predict. I have left quite a few things out of this video that I didn't feel were too important to the overall story of Ionia, such as Akali leaving the Kinkau, Ivan's backstory with the God Willow, Kane's Darkened Scythe, uh, the stuff with Yone and Yasuo. There's a lot there, but it just didn't really fit into this video covering Ionia specifically. Um, so that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.